greetings of that great apostle, the apostle Paul. Uh, grace and peace be unto you uh, from God our Father and from Jesus Christ his Son, who is our Savior, our Redeemer, and our soon coming King. Amen. The Lord uh, is certainly good. Amen. And we thank God for this preaching moment. I just want to express appreciation to you, church family, for uh, keeping me in prayer and uh, encouraging me to rest. I've not had an opportunity to do it, but amen. The Lord uh, is certainly good. Amen. Uh, I appreciate your understanding. Um, two dear friends are in distress, and uh, one who lost his mother and one who is in critical condition. Uh, I want to thank the associate ministers of this church for assisting me uh, in helping the Mount Carmel Church to continue uh, to have worship. Amen. Uh, and that's very important because the people of God, when their uh, pastor of some 20 some odd years uh, lies in critical condition, they need encouragement. Uh, and not only is Pastor Brewer uh, fighting for his life, uh, but the Greater Mount Carmel Church is in some very difficult periods, even before uh, his sickness. And so it's very important that that church continues to meet. Amen. Uh, so we're going to do uh, what needs to be done. Amen. Amen. I want the choir and the church to know I'm committed to First Baptist Church in North Tulsa presents. Amen. Amen. Uh, so much so that at five minutes after seven on last night, Minister Dyer and Brother Darrell called me and wanted me to come meet them at the church so they could bring some equipment in. I said, it's five minutes after seven. Y'all know what was going on last night. Amen. I said, oh, Lord, come on now. I told them I'd meet them at halftime. I met them at halftime. I got them in. They got everything set up. Then they want to do a rehearsal. I said, come on, guys. I got to get back to the house. Amen. I, I'm committed. What's this going on? Amen. I don't know where she went. Amen. But I'm, I'm, I'm committed. Amen. All right. I want to call your attention to the Gospel of St. Luke. Chapter 22, and I'm going to read verses 54, and then also verses 61 and 62. The Gospel of St. Luke, uh, verse 54, uh, and then also verses 61 um, and 62. Uh, having arrested him, they led him away and brought him to the house of the high priest. But Peter was following at a distance. To jump down to verse 61, it says, The Lord turned and looked at Peter and remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. I, I want this morning to speak from the thought, reconcilable distances. Reconcilable distances. We often hear referred to, in legal jargon, when uh, relationships are dissolved, they are dissolved based upon irreconcilable differences. It, it, it connotes the idea that there are two persons who are very close in proximity, but very distant in relationship. And I want you to understand something, my brothers and sisters, that may be true in the world. But when it comes to us and our salvation and it comes to our walk or our distance from the Lord, I want somebody to understand, and I don't know who I'm talking to today, but you need to understand, there is no distance from you and the Lord Amen. that is not reconcilable. Amen. Somebody talk to me here today. As a matter of fact, we need to understand that a good position does not always mean a good condition. Amen. We can be in a good position but not be in a good condition. When you go to Mark chapter 12, verse 34, you'll find there was a rich young ruler who was in a good position. Matter of fact, it was a scribe, excuse me, who was in a good position. And the Lord asked him, which are the greatest commandments? And being in his position, the scribe was able, brother preachers, to give the Lord all of what the greatest commandments are. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. He gave all of the good commandments. He was in a good, he was in a good position, but he was not in a good condition. 
Because the Bible goes on to say to him that, that you are not far from the kingdom of God. In other words, we can be close, but we can be at a distance. And so in this message, my brothers and sisters, as we look at the life of the Apostle Peter, we have not only an evangelistic thrust, but we have a thrust of restoration. Because many of us can think that we have failed so miserably that God cannot turn our failure into success. But please understand, we have not failed ever so miserably in the eyes of God that we cannot be restored. Somebody talk to me here today. I was reading of a man by the name of Phillips Brooks, and Phillips Brooks is one of the greatest preachers uh, in the history uh, of the kingdom of God, and he pastored the Boston Trinity Episcopal Church for many years. But shortly before his death, a young friend wrote to Phillips Brooks and asked him, he said, uh, Mr. Brooks, what is the secret of your strength and your serenity? I noticed that no matter what you go through, no matter what is placed upon your back, you, you are always relaxed and you are always unburdened. I have seen you make some ultimate failures in your life, but ne they never deterred you and kept you from moving forward in a beautiful and heartfelt response, Brooks credited his still growing relationship with the Lord as the foundation for his serenity and strength. In other words, he said, throughout my life and throughout my ministry, I have been growing in the Lord each and every day. And so even though I may have failed, even in my failure, I've been growing in the Lord. I've experienced trials, tribulations, and devastation in my life, but even when I'm going through, I'm growing in the Lord. And so he says that it was a deeper knowledge and truer love of Christ. And he said, I cannot tell you how personal my relationship with Christ is to me. He said, it's so personal that it literally feels like the Lord is here. He knows me and I know him. Let me submit something to you today. When you know that you know that you know the Lord, that he is walking with you, it does not matter what you go through as long as you're walking with him. You continue to grow in your relationship with him. Mr. Brooks said, this is the most real thing in the world, and every day he, he make, it becomes more and more real, and, and the wonders and the light that he experienced of growing in the Lord each and every day cannot be compared to what he is seeing. We must understand, my brothers and sisters, that the Lord in our text, as we are looking at the Lord and the Apostle Peter, we see how the Lord turns failure into achievement. Peter, my brothers and sisters, like many of us, is guilty of disappointing the Lord or letting the Lord down. As we look at the profile of Peter, Peter was a very outspoken leader and, and disciple and follower of Jesus Christ, but yet he was prone to make mistakes in his life. He would make promises that he could not back up. As a matter of fact, we'll notice on, uh, in Matthew chapter 16, Peter speaking for the other disciples said, Jesus, you are the Christ. And, upon, and the Lord said, Peter, you are correct. And on this rock, I'll build my church on the mount of transfiguration. Peter was the first one up on the mountain wanting to make tabernacles because he was in close proximity to the Lord. And yet, when the Lord came to the end of his life, the Bible says that Peter was following the Lord at a distance. My brothers and sisters, whenever we follow the Lord at a distance, now understand, he was close in proximity to the Lord, but he was yet distance from the Lord. And there was a danger, my brothers and sisters, of following the Lord at a distance. We are in his presence, but we're not worshiping. We've got our Bible in our hand, but we're not reading. Somebody talk to me here today. The songs are being sung, but we don't feel them in our heart. We can be close to the Lord, but yet be following the Lord at a distance. We can be in Bible study, but distracted. We can be in prayer service, but our minds are on our troubles. We can be listening to the Word of God, yet there is something coming between us. We are close to the Lord but we're following at a distance. We're in church Sunday after Sunday, but yet we cannot feel his presence. We're not connected to his spirit. We're not empowered by his presence. Following the Lord. Far off. Oftentimes there is a gap between us and the one we are following. 
That's why the Lord says in Matthew 11, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Because when there's a gap between us and the one we are following, we run the risk of getting lost. Please understand that we don't live up always to the best that is in us. We will often disappoint the Lord. And whenever we are not living up to the best in us, we are not cheating the Lord. We are cheating ourselves. Good news is the Lord always provides a remedy and an opportunity for restoration. We've got to learn, my brothers and sisters, how to put our failures behind us. Charles Kettering, uh, an innovator, uh, a creator, suggested that we must learn to fail intelligently. Each failure is one more step leading up the cathedral of success. He said the only time you don't want to fail is the last time you try. So the fact of the matter is as long as we get up and keep trying, you just don't ever want to stop trying the last time you fail. One of the greatest ball players ever to live led the major leagues in strikeouts with 1,316 strikeouts. The same player set a record for five consecutive strikeouts in the World Series. He was the holder of both records, the most strikeouts and the most strikeouts in the World Series, and his name was Babe Ruth. And the reason why Babe Ruth was such a successful baseball player is because he never let disappointment or failure keep him from achieving the latter in cathedral of success. In our text today, we find Peter being one who not only failed in life, he failed the Lord. And my brothers and sisters, all of us have failed the Lord at some point in our life. But please understand, failing the Lord is not the end because the Lord in his grace and his mercy will turn our failure into triumph. How is it? that the Lord turns our failure into triumph. We see grace in the text because even though Peter was following at a distance, it says in verse 61 that the Lord turned and the Lord looked at Peter. You need to understand something, my brothers and sisters, and G. Campbell Morgan says that the look of Jesus would have been wasted if Peter had not been looking at Jesus. The look of Jesus toward Peter would have been a failure if Peter had not been looking at Jesus. I want you to understand something. You're not in this place by accidents. You are in this place by providence because you are going through in your life. You've been tried and going through trials in your life. And you did not even feel like getting up and coming to the house of the Lord today. So much on your mind, so much discouragement, so much despair, and the Lord would not leave you alone. He said, get up, get dressed, come into the house of the Lord. You've been struggling in worship, but the Lord wants you to come so you can look at him and he can look at you. The Bible says the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter said to the Lord, Lord, I'll go with you all the way. Bible says he denied Peter three times. That's good to know the world gives you one, two, three strikes. But the Lord is a God of not just a second chance, but somebody know he's a God of another chance. Because we didn't already used up our second chance. Somebody talked to me here today. Matter of fact, we didn't use up all our chances. But the Lord keeps on forgiving us and giving us another chance. Amen. And understand, another chance is another chance. The Lord continues to pick us up, clean us up, set us in our right mind, set us on the rock to stay, and allow us to continue to live. God. Praise. How this must have disappointed the Lord. Can you see the look in the Lord's eyes? It was Peter of all people. Peter who had disappointed the Lord. But every time we deny the Lord, we let the Lord down. Every time we don't acknowledge the Lord in public, we let the Lord down. Every time somebody is talking bad about the church and we don't say anything, we let the Lord down. Every time when they tell us not to pray and we listen and don't pray, we let the Lord down. It's not just Peter who disappoints, but all those who claim to be children of God. Notice the feeling of being forsaken by friends, but yet having to continue on. The Bible says the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And the Bible says, but then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how the Lord said, Peter, I knew you was going to do this. As a matter of fact, when you back up and look, he told Peter, he said, Peter, Satan desires to sift you. 
He wants to sift you as meat. But Peter, I know you're going to fail, but I've already prayed for your restoration. And when you get restored, when I pick you up and I turn you around, I want you to go, Peter, and strengthen your brethren. We need to understand that in spite of our shortcomings, we serve a God of a second or another chance. And so we need to understand whatever it is we're going through, Peter teaches us that failure is not fatal. Please understand that you may have failed in life. You may have failed miserably, spiritually, but failure is not fatal. The Lord will not give up on you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. As a matter of fact, his love is a chasing love. He will chase you down like a hound dog because he loves you so much. No matter how you fail. Matter of fact, the Bible records many, many failures because the Bible records life as it is. I know we have many Bible heroes that we worship and adore, but you won't find any hero in the Bible that did not fail before they became a Bible hero. Moses failed. Abraham failed. Joshua failed. The prophets failed. The disciples failed. Paul failed. They all failed and fell short of the glory of God. That's what makes the Bible good news. It's a book about failures in the hand of God. And when God picked them up, cleaned them up, turned them around, they were able to do great things for God. Peter reminds us not only that failure is not fatal, but Peter reminds us that we should recognize that everyone fails. All of us follow the Lord far off. And so we should not be looking and pointing fingers at anybody else. Because all of us at some point in life are following the Lord at a distance. And rather than pointing the fingers, we need to remind each and every one of us about God's love and God's forgiveness. God's love and forgiveness are not dependent upon success. As a matter of fact, the more you mess up, the more God loves you. Somebody talk to me here today. So many failed men and women find new futures in the hand of the Lord. Lord turn and looked at Peter. And all the Lord had to do was look at him and that brought him to Jesus. You need to understand you've got to put your failures behind us. Notice the difference between what happens when a man says to himself, I am failed, and when he says to himself, I am a failure. Please understand, you're not a failure. You may have failed, but you're not a failure because we don't serve a God, a God uh, who allows us to just keep on failing. Please understand that the Lord in our text reminds Peter that there's no distance that cannot be reconciled. There's no gap that cannot be bridged. And so all we've got to do is trust God no matter where we are in life to bring us out. Amen. There was a young girl who accepted Christ. And after accepting Christ, she did what everyone said. She followed the Lord in baptism. And not only did she follow the Lord in baptism, my friends, but she sought membership in a local church. And when she sought membership in the church, the deacon asked her a question. He said, were you a sinner before you received the Lord Jesus Christ in your life? The young girl said, yes, Brother Deacon, I was a sinner before I received the Lord Jesus Christ in my life. The deacon said, but well, are you still a sinner? The little girl said, to tell you the truth, Brother Deacon, I'm a greater sinner now than ever before. So then the deacon said, well, what real change have you experienced in your life? The little girl said, I don't quite know how to explain it, but let me put it like this. At one point, I was running after sin. Now, I'm running from sin. Somebody talk to me here today. And we need to understand that that woman continued, girl, continued to grow in Christ. Please understand that we all have let the Lord down. But the good news is that we are sinners who are saved by grace. We're no longer running to wrong, we're running away from wrong. And when wrong, some wrong sometimes catches up with us. Bible says, sin not, but if you're faithful and just, he'll forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm so glad today that the blood still works. The blood that gave me strength on yesterday will give me strength on this side of the cross. The blood that gave me strength to redeem me from a life of sin. That blood is bridging the distance between me and Christ each and every day. That woman reached out and she continued to 
grow. And the reason why she continued to grow, because she realized that God was one who said he can turn the trash and the predicaments of our life into priceless treasure. We must understand that God is one who minds, who minds the world for those who are lost. He said those who are not, who are well, have no need of a physician. But the good news is he came to heal a sin-sick soul and to make the wounded whole. That's why Jesus died, because there was a gap and a distance between the world and the Father. But Jesus hung wide, stretched on the cross, that he might bridge the gap and reconcile us to God. There is no distance. There's no mountain. There's no valley to keep you from the love and the forgiveness of God. That's why the Bible said, come while the blood yet runs warm. In your veins, there are no distances that are not reconcilable in the kingdom of God. But the Lord would have us today to give this evangelistic and restoration thrust for anyone who is lost, for anyone who is near the kingdom, but yet still lost. We want you to understand it is very important and critical that you make having a saving relationship with Jesus Christ your number one priority in life. That's a distance that you've got to bridge. And you can only bridge that by acknowledging your sins, your sins, and your need for pardon that only come from a resurrected and a living Savior. We stand, the deacons are coming, we extend this invitation. First of all, from an evangelistic standpoint, for those who have never embraced Christ as Lord and Savior, we extend this invitation for those who have never entered into a living relationship with Christ. How do I do that? The Bible says the wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life. We've all sinned, come short of the glory and the kingdom of God. We've created a gap and a distance between us and God, both by our original sin, but by our own sin. We ask you to come and give your hand and your heart to Christ in order that that gap might be bridged by the blood of Christ. He is a bridge over troubled waters to bridge that gap. If you're already redeemed and saved, we give a message of restoration. You may not have been as close to the Lord as you needed to be. You may be redeemed and saved and are not committed to a local church. We give this, 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 this invitation for restoration and for church membership to come and commit yourself to the local church where you can grow in grace and experience the fellowship and the connection with other believers. We invite you to come as we extend this most critical invitation. Come while the blood yet runs warm in your veins.